on the vlog again. Just can't wait to do a vlog again. The life I love is making vlogs for my friends. And I can't wait to do a vlog again. Doing a vlog again. Going places that I've never been. Seeing things that I may never see again. And I can't wait to do a vlog again. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Top Vloggers. As always, I am High and Mighty Joe hanging out with the lovely cat and we got Aaron as well. We are at the Ernie Pyle World War II Museum. We came here last week. It should be fun and exciting. Let's go ahead and jump right back into it. In this war, I have known a lot of officers who were loved and respected by the soldiers under them, but never have I crossed the trail of any man as beloved as Captain Henry T. Wasco of Belton, Texas. Captain Wasco was a company commander in the 36th Infantry Division. He had led his company since long before it left the States. He was very young, only in his mid-twenties, but he carried an in sincerity and gentleness that made people want to be guided by him. The sergeant told me that after my own father, he came next. A soldier said, he always looked after us. He'd go to bat for us every time. Another one said, I never knew him to do anything unfair. I was at the foot of the mule train the night they brought Captain Wasco down. The moon was nearly full at the time, and you could see far up the trail and even part way across the valley below. Soldiers made shadows in the moonlight as they walked. Dead men had been coming down the mountain all evening, lashed onto the backs of mules. They came lying belly down across the wooden pack saddles, their heads hanging down on the left side of the mule, their stiffened legs sticking out awkwardly from the other side, bobbing up and down as the mule walked. The Italian mule skinners were afraid to walk beside dead men, so Americans had to leave the mules down that night. Even the Americans were reluctant to unlash and lift off the bodies at the bottom, so an officer had to do it himself and ask others to help. The first one came early in the morning, they slid him down from the mule and stood him on his feet for a moment while they got a new grip. In the half-light, he might have been merely a sick man standing there, leaning on others. Then they laid him on the ground in the shadow of the low stone wall alongside the road. I don't know who the first one was. You feel small in the presence of dead men and ashamed at being alive and you don't ask silly questions. We left him beside the road, that first one. And we all went back into the cow shed and sat on water cans or lay on straw, waiting for the next batch of mules. Somebody said the dead soldier had been dead for four days, and then nobody said anything more about it. We talked soldier talk for an hour or more. The dead man lay all alone outside in the shadow of the low stone wall. Then a soldier came into the cow shed and said there were more bodies outside. We went out into the road. Four mules stood there in the moonlight in the road where the trail came down off the mountain. The soldier who led them stood there waiting. This one is Captain Wasco, one of them said quietly. Two men unlashed his body from the mule and lifted it off and laid it in the shadow beside the low stone wall. Other men took the other bodies off. Finally, there were five lying end to end in a long row alongside the road. You don't cover up dead men in the combat zone. They just lie there in the shadows until somebody else comes after them. The unburdened mules moved off to their olive orchard. The men in the road seemed reluctant to leave. They stood around and gradually, one by one, I could sense them moving closer to Captain Wasco's body. Not so much to look, I think, as to say something in finality to him and to themselves. I stood close by and I could hear. One soldier came and looked down and he said out loud, God damn it. That's all he said. And then he walked away. Another came and he said, God damn it to hell anyway. He looked down for a few last minutes and then turned and left. Another man came. I think he was an officer. It was hard to tell officers from men in the half-light, for all were bearded and grimy dirty. The man looked down into the dead captain's face. And then he spoke directly to him as though he were alive, and he said, I'm sorry, old man. 
Then a soldier came and stood beside the officer and bent over, and he too spoke to his dead captain, not in a whisper, but awfully tenderly. And he said, I sure am sorry, sir. Then the first man squatted down and he reached over and took the dead hand and he sat there for a full five minutes holding the dead hand in his own and looking intently into the dead face and he never uttered a sound all the time he was there. And finally he put the hand down and then he reached up and gently straightened the points of the captain's shirt collar and then he sort of rearranged the tattered edges of his uniform around the wound and then he got up and walked away down the road in the moonlight all alone after that the rest of us went back into the cow shed leaving the five dead men lying in a line end to end in the shadow of the low stove wall we lay down on the straw in the cow shed and pretty soon we were all asleep Now that is a telegraph reproduction sent to Ernie's father telling of Ernie's death in the Pacific. This is the last known picture of Ernie Pyle. The picture was taken in the evening of April 17, 1945 on Iwo Jima. Rest in peace Ernie. Now here is a copy of the Stars and Stripes uh, covering Ernie's death, which is ironic because they used to cover Ernie's columns. This is a Japanese flag that was autographed by Ernie Pyle in Okinawa on 4 7 of 1945, and radio correspondent Norman Page, Okinawa 4 9 1945. Here is a bust of Ernie that was done in September 1944 at a Manhattan studio. Looks like this fellow's having a cup of joe. Take a look at all these cool patches. It's on the other side as well. Let me know in the comments below how many of these patches you recognize and have seen before. Now that was a fantastic museum and they have, uh, as you can see, lots of shirts and books and things like that that you can get. Stop by the gift store if you happen to be here and uh, Go ahead and buy something. Uh, everything, uh, all of the proceeds, I believe, go to uh, the museum to uh, help it uh, continue running. And uh, also, just so you know, you can also get these sweet little action figures of Ernie Pyle right here. Uh, only place that I know you can get them besides online is right here. And this is the only place that you can get the correct box. So, there you go. Right here at the museum. Uh, this home originally set out in the country. It said a mile and a half to the southwest, and that was a Sam Elder farm. At the time of Ernie's birth, they were tenant farmers for the elders. Um, the elders had built a home in town, and then uh, the Paws were living here, and they were just basically using the downstairs. Uh, it was just Ernie and his, his you know, mom and dad, so they didn't really need the whole upstairs. Well, there wouldn't be any heat up there also. <coughs> when the elders lived here, this was a parlor. Across the hall was a sitting room. 
then upstairs with the bedrooms. Um, like I said, the Pauls use it downstairs. They probably didn't even use this room. Be another room you'd have to heat. And they are set up where you can close it off and not have to worry about it. Um, once we took all the war stuff out in 95, <coughs> excuse me, we basically got donations from all over. So we had a lot of donated furnishings. We were able to get the black rocker that belonged to Ernie's dad. The clock on the mantel was his Aunt Mary's and the checkerboard was Ernie's. And then just recently we received his little desk. And that was from, a, I told you about the cousin that had some things. So yeah, then with that. So that's Ernie's desk. Mm -hmm. And then that's his checkered board. Yep. And then that is his dad's rocker. Black yep. rocking chair. See how small it is? Short. <laughs> they were short people. Yeah. There you go. And this is kind of set up. Of course, your entertainment was your stereoscope with all your 3D, kind of like a Viewmaster, that, which now kids don't know what that is. <laughs> I had one of those. Yeah, our kids have Viewmaster. This is. I can say this would have been a sitting room, but this was the Pyle's bedroom. This is the room that Ernie was born in. So I do that. Uh, everything in here has been donated, and then it's directly connected to the Pyle's. Except the picture above the mantel, that's Will and Maria, that's Ernie's mom and dad. And that was taken in 1899, around the time of their wedding. Uh, for that time period, they were considered elderly to be getting married and starting a family, and they were 29 and 30. <laughs> Hard to imagine. But your typical washstand they would have upstairs to bathe before you came down. <clears throat> and then your little bed with a high headboard, feather mattress, feather pillows. Uh, then the quilt was made in 1920. We have it mainly because of the names. It was donated here. And it was um, a group of church ladies in St. Bernice. Uh, their church needed a new roof, so they had this idea. Uh, for a quarter, you would sign your name in pencil. The ladies embroidered over the top of your signature, and then they put it in a quilt. And then they uh, they had 400 names, so they raised $100. They were told they raffled it off and raised another 100 But in 1920, $200 would have been a big amount of money. A lot of money. A lot different than nowadays. And then this is a this is the dining room that the elder family used their dining table in here. Again, I don't know how much of this ha part that the piles would have used, but about every farmhouse had a little dining area and then day bed in the corner for different night things. If you had a sick child, it was great to have him downstairs. Also in the summertime, Dad would be out in the field bright and early. When he came in for lunch, right after he ate, he'd probably lay down and take a little rest before he went back out in the field. And there's a little hobby horse I was telling we got that was Ernie's. And we've always had this picture here. For... You guys, check out that horse. Isn't that awesome? See, this was the, we've had this picture for a while, and we've always wondered was that his or? Well, when we got that donated this spring, okay, there's his horse. <laughs> and there is Ernie on his horse. My niece has a little riding horse. Of course, it's a lot newer. Well, yeah. You know what I mean? But she has a little riding horse like that. And I and I told her, I said, I said, Uncle Buddy, that's what she calls me. I said, Uncle Buddy used to have one of those when he was a little kid. Yeah. And she goes, a horse? And I was like, yeah, because Mama wouldn't let me have a real horse. Ma'am wouldn't let me have a real one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I it's like, that's about as good as it was going to get. It's yeah. a little wooden one. So. Right, right on the floor. Yeah, that was probably in the before 40s. he. I was gonna say before yeah. he died. Then yeah, I imagine it was in the forties if I remember. Yeah, and I like to point out the young people. You see, they came to town. See how they dress. They put their sport coats on and their hats. Yeah. And if the ladies came in. The ladies would put their better dresses on and their they wore hat. Yeah. And this Ernie is the This is where all the action happened. This is where it all happened. When the house set out in the country, of course, it didn't have a basement, and they put a basement in when they moved it in, so that kitchen would have gone out here where the stairway is, and a little bit bigger. Also, if you went out this door across the porch, there was another little building, and that was your summer kitchen. And they used that in the summertime to do their canning and all that to keep the heat out of the house. <coughs> so your wood box, your laundry, that stuff had been sitting either in the, in the, in the uh, yeah, summer kitchen or out on the porch. But yeah, this is what I had to do, get the fire going. 
you know, the wood going up. Just put your wood in. And then you had uh, kept that full of water and you had hot water then to dip out to wash up or to shave. And then this is your warming area. You can put your regular rice. And then if you wanted to keep the food left over, you could put it up there to keep it warm and you could also close it if you needed it. Great creative. And these were your irons. This is how you did your iron. Put them on here until they got nice and hot. Almost, if you think about it, so elegantly done. Right. It's almost like, why did they screw with it to, you know, I know. to make it what it is now? It's like, I almost would rather have this, it's I so think. Simple. Like, it, yeah, makes everything so... Like, like everything right here at once, like why yeah. mess around? Like, Yeah, we have a lot of, I have some of the younger kids, one well, no, this is your microwave. <laughs> But they're used to seeing the microwave above the stove. And, and it kind of is. It is. And, you know, it is. It, I'm it sure because heat does rise, so yeah, I'm sure so that if you put you stuff do. there, it would have it would have kept it could, warm. Yeah, you could put dough to rise. You would get the heat from here to rise. Like I said, and maybe if you've got one dish that's done, you could put that here and close it, and it's, it would stay warm then while you're fixing the rest. Yeah. And they were very inventive. And then, of course, you see the wood box out there. And your laundry... You use this to heat the water, and then you have the big round tubs on each side that would actually wash and rinse. And if you were lucky to have a stand to put it on, some of them were just sitting on the ground outside. And then your homemade lye soap, scrub it on the scrub board. And then, of course, you'd rinse it and wring it out with the wringer and put it on the clothesline. That's definitely not the first scrub board I've seen in my life. No, there's quite a few. Mama, yes. Mama used to tell me that uh, she'd say we... Her, her joke was, uh, she'd go, we were so poor we couldn't afford a scrub board. <laughs> well, this one I like. So this is, of course, that's typical. This is actually made during the war. And it's actually all wood, if you notice. And most of them have metal. Right. And if you read on there, it says this washboard is, you know, see that? This washboard was made of materials not needed for defense and help with the war. Well, there you go. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I wonder how many of those there are I out there. I don't know. That's the first wood one I've seen. I, there, there may be some, but I'm sure, somewhere. But and Then, of course, you kept a bucket of drinking water in. Everybody shared the same dipper. Take a drink, put it back in. The next person did the same thing. Same thing with the pump outside. You have a dipper or a cup hanging out there. Kids playing over, visitors, whatever. You drink out of the same thing. Shared all your germs back then. I'm sure they did the old hand. Well, yeah, I'm too. sure they did. Sure they did. We, we thought as kids, you thought that was great to do right, that, yeah, but we, you made a mess with it. But right. Yeah. And of course, no bathroom or anything, so Dad did the shaving in the kitchen. Get all soaked up with the lather of that, and then he did the old straight razor. And then, of course, when it got dull, he just reached over here with the and sharpened it back and forth. And then, of course, that was always hanging there, hanging backwards, but anyway. And then, if you misbehave, you probably would take that down and get your attention real quick. Your business. I don't know if you're familiar with Because you, you had to call Sally yeah. to hook up to, to, to yeah. be able to call Frank down at the yeah. hardware store. <laughs> You just had to crank that and tell her who you wanted to call. And if you were calling one of your lady, you know, neighbors, a friend, if she, she might be able to tell you that she's not home and could tell you where she's at. Because <laughs> they knew everything. But that's where all the calls went through. And that's Ernie's dad taking in later years on phone similar to ours. That almost looks identical. Uh huh. This, almost this is a little bit different. See here, that, that doesn't have this around. Doesn't have the engravement in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's about here. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this vlog. I hope you guys uh, really enjoyed it. I know I really enjoyed it, bringing it to you right here in front of the childhood home of Ernie Pyle. It was a uh, it was a tremendous vlog, and I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot. I hope you guys did too. And uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're new here. Take it one step f closer and ring that notification bell and uh, give this video a big thumbs up if you liked it and if you didn't give it a big thumbs down 
You can also join us on all of our social media websites, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Top Vloggers. Also, if you'd like to help us reach the top, you can do so by going to www.patreon.com backslash The Top Vloggers. Without your help and support, these vlogs would be almost impossible to do. And again, I think that's going to do it for us here today in front of the Ernie Pyle World War II Museum. Until next time, Top Vloggers, out. Okay, we are at the Ernie Pyle